Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. One minute. One minute. Okay. Ведущих стран Европы. Yeah, we need the NATO. Yeah, present everywhere, from Lithuania to the Sahel, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Lebanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hello, I'm Olga Olaker. I'm Hugh Pope. Welcome. Here on War and Peace, we talk about Europe. Russia, the neighborhood that the two of them share, Turkey, and the issues that affect all of these countries. We're going to be paying particular attention to conflict, both in the region and nearby, and the conflicts that these countries get involved in far away. We want to understand how states' policies and actions help or hinder prospects for peace and resolution. But because conflict can't be understood without a broader context, we're also going to be bringing you some thoughts on that context, from politics to society to culture. In today's episode, we're very excited to be speaking with Bert Kunders, former Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs until quite recently, um, former Undersecretary General of the United Nations, and perhaps uh, not incidentally, a member of the Crisis Group Board, for which we are very grateful. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start by um, asking you a bit of a general question, and but maybe one that can spark some discussion between us. Mm-hmm. You left government about two years ago. Yeah, a year and a half. How do you think the European security outlook has changed in that time? It's been a busy year and a half. It's been very busy, but I think it's really been shifting fundamentally in the last four to five years. Mm -hmm. And what Um, are those shifts? Well, I think there are many, but let me just mention a few. I think all the predictability that we thought was existing Mm -hmm. in Europe, both internally in our own ways of doing things, our coherence, our cooperation has become much more difficult in the last uh, uh, couple of years. You see that the coherence in the European Union is difficult, different political parties, different countries with different interests. So one element, I think, what has changed uh, is the internal coherence of the European Union. So Europe itself is changing, the European Union. Europe is fundamentally changing, but not by itself. It's changing because... Uh, societies are changing. We've had uh, so many issues that are close to the interests of our citizens uh, regarding migration, climate change, uh, the issue of our austerity and economic policies. And they have uh, left our countries with a big internal debate about the future of our nations and our uh, the state of, of the European Union as well. But I think when we talk about the conflicts around Europe, uh, something else has changed. The predictability of our uh, transatlantic relationships, for sure with the sort of tweet of Damocles mm-hmm. every day from, from President uh, Trump, uh, sort of the Anglo-Saxon retreatment from Europe, which you see with Brexit. And also, I think uh, we were used to a relative predictable rest or unrest around us. And now we have, of course, the Russia that broke out of what I would guess is there was the Cold War consensus with the policies in the Ukraine. We see more complexities in the Balkans. The Middle East, which is on fire, mm-hmm. and North Africa, which is in change. So we have, you could say, a ring of instability around this changing Europe. And the consequence of that is that what we were used to have, namely what we thought is exporting stability to our surroundings, we seem to be importing instability. And I think that requires a much stronger position in diplomacy and, and, and peace when it comes to European foreign policy. And that's pretty difficult right now. But do you think the recent elections to the new leadership positions in the European Union are going to strengthen Europe as it faces these challenges? I hope so, because it's absolutely crucial. I think when we talk to all strategic interests of the European countries, uh, stability requires a much more strategic culture and positioning of Europe. But I say at the same time, I'm not yet convinced that it will happen. We will have, it is not preordained. The new leadership will still have to prove itself. Uh, we have a new uh, foreign policy lead uh, Mr. Borrell from, from Spain, who I know from the past, uh, but he cannot do it by himself. My own experience as foreign minister was especially in the last year as foreign minister, how we had really a lack of consensus around very crucial issues, be it the relationship with Russia, how to deal with the Ukraine, what to do with migration, even policies towards Libya. And we have to change that. I think it's possible. I think nothing is preordained. You see also in these last elections, 
that uh, although there were different outcomes, uh, for instance, in Italy, uh, uh, the UK and France compared to some of the other countries in terms of the populist rise, you saw a mixed picture, but there was one hope and that has to be translated in those policies of the people that have just been recruited. Everybody is now interested in the future of Europe. We have more voters than ever. They are debating. Europe is politicized and that's the way it should be. So if I may be a little provocative on this point, if Europe failed to a large extent to export stability, at least to the extent necessary, to, and so much so that it's now importing instability, do we know, do Europeans know, does anybody know how Europe can now start exporting stability, uh, which has become much more important because it poses more of a real threat than perhaps we thought? Uh, yes, I think there are you know, policies that could be supported, but I think we have to be critically looking at what we have done so far. Don't forget that we were actually on very many stabilizing missions, including in Eastern Europe. I think the enlargement process in itself, whatever one thinks of it, was uh, one of conflict prevention, of conflict management, of enlarging the, the space of peace and security. When you have a larger European Union as a consequence of this, and you go to 27, 28, then obviously the consensus building uh, inside of Europe becomes more difficult. So the price of, of one is a consequence of the other. Uh, nevertheless, uh, if you look at the last couple of years that I can judge, uh, it's not that we don't come up with policies. I think even on the issue of migration, when you see where we started off as a complete chaos, Clearly, we are trying now to put uh, policies forward towards uh, Africa, towards uh, the Middle East, but they are by far not sufficient, and that's why I'm worried. I think there has to be much more of a diplomatic and strategic culture in Europe, because I even see on issues like Libya that we are differing, or on Russia, and that is, you know, if, if you want to have a Europe which is weakening itself and having itself divided, maybe even by, by Putin or by Trump, then you will also get a reaction. And I see the start of that reaction as well. I think uh, at the same time, uh, Europe has been very often uh, uh, said that it would be coming a museum and, mm -hmm. and there would be only division and would be no reaction to this negative uh, flow of, of, of events. We have to reinforce that. And that has to be done sometimes by countries uh, that form coalitions with each other, mm -hmm. maybe not with everybody. You've talked a little bit about North Africa and the Middle East, yeah. and we've talked uh, about migration. Tell me a little bit about, specifically, you've worked on Mali, on Niger. Why should Europeans care? How do these conflicts in these countries affect them directly? Or do well, they? I think first and foremost, I'm saying that also as a board member of the mm -hmm. crisis group, there is a real interest in, in, in peace and security and diplomacy. It's a, it's a humanitarian, it's a moral, but I think it's also a foreign policy interest uh, of, of Europe. Secondly, the borders with Europe, if we like it or not, are not anymore in, uh, here in the, in, the, in the neighborhood of Brussels. They are in Lampedusa. And now what we are seeing is that Europe tries to externalize these borders uh, to some countries in Africa. And that leads to, in my view, a lot of, of, uh, of issues. The, the most important goal in this area would be, and I've worked as a head of the peacekeeping mission in Mali, I've been a lot in the region, is to see Africa really as a foreign policy priority, not just as a humanitarian or a development priority, but a continent which has de is developing on its own, but where certain areas are areas of bad governance. And the answers to that cannot only be a military answers. That's, I mean, fantastic. So how do you do it? I mean, this seems to be something that has proven very, very difficult yeah. to actually find. Right, the military solution doesn't work. It just causes more war. But the diplomatic solution doesn't seem to be getting us there either. And the development challenges continue to be many. And this is another one where the code hasn't been cracked on how yeah. you do this right. Uh, well, I remember very well when I was working in Mali that the Secretary General of the UN and the President of the World Bank came and they say, now we have a big initiative on the Sahel, which, of course, everybody welcomed. And then a few years later, we saw actually not a whole lot happened. Mm -hmm. uh, there are now some some individual initiatives uh, around France, around the United Nations in Mali, around building up the militaries. There are other initiatives that deal somewhat with diplomacy, but my general lesson for today would be that we are in the process of militarizing conflicts rather than 
diplomacy and talking. If you look to Mali, the, the, we have to get back to put the emphasis on central Mali, where there are major issues, such as massacres between ethnic groups, politicized on the one side by bad governments in Bamako, on the other side uh, by uh, over-militarization and the rise of jihadism. So you will have to invest in talking to local leaders. You'll have to make sure that the development community is not doing only something big in four years, but is helping a peace agreement right now. While you were in Mali, do you have any examples from your experiences there of some kind of outreach that can help? Because we're talking about speaking to jihadists, aren't we? Yes. Yes, first of all, uh, in, 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 in my time, which was in uh, 2013 and, and, and 14, it was then the rebellion who had very porous borders with jihadists. And we were able, we uh, would say, especially the Malians, to have a peace agreement there. Now, the implementation of that is very complex. But at the moment that you invest in that peace agreement and you don't work sufficiently on service delivery, on social protection, on a future of the young people there, then yes, of course, uh, the, the big leader will be not what we used to say, Mr. Marlboro, namely the cigarette trade uh, through the Sahara. It will be Mr. Human Trafficking. Uh, and at the same time, you have to ensure that you work with local religious leaders and political leaders in the center of Mali. That has been forgotten, uh, both by the government as the international community. And that is extremely risky. And I, I, I wouldn't say we should have any taboos on this. And I think the a recent uh, uh, international crisis group report around this is is very illuminating because it says let's at least break the taboo. It will be difficult to talk to what we call terrorists, and they often are if we see it, the killings on the ground. But we also see that a, a strictly military solution is also not working. By the way, I am very much in favor of the peacekeeping operation. I think when we talk about Europe, I was proud and I'm happy that Europe came back to peacekeeping. But I'm even afraid that we lose that. Given that uh, Europe has a clear migration priority, of, and clearly there's a, a, a need for Europe to to, to build up the, the the governance in these states and make them more attractive places for their own population, why do you think that European support for such peacekeeping operations, or or at least building up these states has, has become so weak? Well, we have to do two things, I think. One is, yes, the migration lens is understandable, but if we look only at these issues there from a migration point of view, we won't solve anything. It's much too defensive. It's seen Africa as a risk and not as an opportunity. So let's use that argument, but at the same time make sure that we make strategic partnerships with these countries on legal forms of migration, on development on working also yes on uh, working around the militaries but do this in a more coherent way and not only from a defensive point of view it simply won't work that's one side of the uh, argument and the the other side i i think is that uh, europe has become i mentioned that already and i criticize this we are a bit fashionable when it comes to our military engagement uh, I was able to get some Dutch troops back into Mali. The Germans have come to help also the French there and to support the African troops there. But what we really need is when we have European security cooperation and European defense cooperation, that we lead it, in fact, actually to support for these multilateral arrangements. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. So we are talking to former Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs, Bert Kenders. We've been talking about European interests and roles in, in Africa and the militarization of stabilization over the last few years. Thank you so much uh, again for being with us. Thank um, you. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to pivot. We always pivot in foreign policy, but I want to. I want to pivot to. And they, they often go wrong, the and pivots. they often go terribly. Yeah. So <laughs> let, let's hope that this one doesn't go that let's badly. Try. We started off talking a little bit about Russia yeah. and its changing role, and I want to come back to that because we think about places far away, at least comparatively far away, that have an impact on European security. But Russia is in Europe and having quite a substantial impact. Can you? talk a little bit about whether or not you think policymakers in Europe, in the United States, in the West generally seem to get Russia wrong? Or do we have Russia right and just haven't figured out the policies to respond? I don't think we get Russia wrong. Uh, Russia is part of Europe, complex country. It's become more and more autocratic. 
uh, it has also broken some of the rules we thought were fixed rules in the international community regarding the use of violence to change territorial borders and so on and so forth. And it is, I think, for peacemakers, and this is what our goal is, to find the right ways to deal with specific issues and the way we look at Russia. Let me start to begin with, with the Ukraine, which right. is, I think, the most the sensitive. I've been very much involved in it personally also. We were, you know, my country was very much involved in the so-called MH17 Absolutely. flight, the association agreement with Ukraine, where we had a referendum in our country. Uh, my sense is, if I say what Europe could do right now, we have a new president in, in Ukraine. Uh, we have new leadership in Europe. We have at least an American special representative, Mr. Volker, who deals with that. This is, in my view, the time again to take a, a mm -hmm. new diplomatic initiative. There are developments in Ukraine right now which I think are not necessarily positive, but give some room for initiative. Uh, it's important now to build consensus. And so I think it's the time at least to work around two mm -hmm. issues, namely build this confidence in the Ukraine and with the Ukraine, Again, try to talk to Russia around, uh, mm -hmm. on this, which is as key. And I think an old idea could be used again, which is a very complicated one, namely a UN peacekeeping operation, mm -hmm. which could refor not reformulate Minsk, but help the sequencing in a way that gives mm -hmm. trust to all parties and also the possibility for Russian forces to leave the country. So, of course, we have uh, a new crisis group report that deals with a lot of these issues and makes a lot of the points that you have made. It's very much in line with what you've just said. I think the concern is that, and this has been my concern with Ukraine all along, from the outside, I can see paths forward. But for both Kiev and Moscow, historically, they've taken very maximalist positions and attitudes that any compromise is anathema. You, even one step towards the adversary is giving up the ghost and will lead to total defeat. And I'm concerned that we won't be able to overcome that, that even if the new Ukrainian president is interested in, in that, even if the people who elected him are interested in peace, there's still enough of a strong nationalist movement. And conversely, in Moscow, while there are people who want Donbass resolved, even if Crimea never will be, yeah. um, there are others who are concerned that it's a slippery slope to Russia giving up all power Thoughts on how you can bring these two countries together to actually move forward? Well, the, the honest answer is a little bit of, of, of realism in this. I think there are a few conditions that we at least have to keep the conditions for such an initiative, as I just mentioned. The peacekeeping. The peacekeeping, but also some of the other issues which mm -hmm. might actually help uh, Zelensky and, and, and some of the Western leaders to, to, to deal with Putin in this on this. I remember the discussions we had in NATO, but also in the international community on linkage between Syria and, uh, and Ukraine. I remember very well that every moment there was a discussion on, on the Ukraine, uh, people said, OK, but don't link it because the Syrian is a different thing and don't give up the interests of the Ukrainian people. This, we, do, we should not do the same with the Syrians, but I think there are a few conflicts in which also the, the Russians are in demand of certain types of solutions which we might try to explore. Such as? Such as Syria. Mm -hmm. And what about Russian involvement in Africa? I mean, that's... Something yeah, that's Russian involvement in Africa is, I think, uh, uh, frankly, limited. But uh, we have seen, of course, the events in the Central African Republic and in other places. Uh, limited won't say that it's unimportant because, uh, as you know, in certain countries which are very fragile, which don't have institutions, you can easily, with some military support, uh, some intelligence initiatives, especially with some hybrid warfare where the Russians are pretty good at, you can de destabilize uh, uh, countries. Uh, I don't think they're a big player compared to, to the, the, you know, China or France or other countries. But we should carefully look at that. But you've talked very eloquently about the divisions in Europe making difficulties for common policy. When it comes to facing Russia, have you experienced the same kind of divisions? And perhaps you could give us some details from the very intimate and difficult time you had personally dealing with Russia over the Ukraine and the, and the tragic downing of that aircraft. How did you build a consensus around what you needed to be done? I was actually amazed, to be very honest, that we stuck so well together. I remember very well when I became Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2014, and this was, of course, the key year of what happened in the Ukraine. No, Europe will 
divide itself very quickly on Russia. In fact, on all the key issues, sanctions policy, on support when certain crisis situations occurred, I was always struck that in the end, you know, the Europeans stuck together. That something else is having a strategy. In my personal view is that these sanctions should remain because of the reasons uh, that we just mentioned, this breaking of Russia out of international rules. But that's not necessarily the same as a positive strategy. And there I see differences. Look at the position of Italy at the moment, position of, of Hungary. And these are really, uh, they, they look at a different way in Russia, including even ideologically. And that's my biggest fear. I mean, we're talking about a ring of instability. We get a new schism between autocracy and democracy, which is also getting its way into Europe. And we have to defend our institutions and innovate them to stop that. So you, you've... I mean, obviously, the, you managed to get a, a remarkable unity on those big crises as a reaction. You're advocating that we have groups of European states having a strategy together. Will such less than the whole groups of European states have any weight against Russia or if they have to come look, in? Look, you can make yourself as big as small as you want yourself. At the moment, yeah. we are not projecting uh, any serious power when it comes to the real issues. I'm not even talking about, you know, uh, the, the, from a moral or humanitarian point of view, but simply from our own strategic uh, interest. Take, for instance, the whole issue of Syria, uh, where maybe Europe, except for the disastrous humanitarian consequences of, of the Assad regime, of uh, ISIS, of, of, of the Russian intervention, in fact, the issue of refugee flows was something that Europe was especially confronted with, including Turkey, by the way. Now, we have tried to do something, but I don't see a very sensible policy right now. I think some of the uh, the ideas of the International Crisis Group on the stabilization of at least begin somewhere on northeastern Syria is still extremely relevant. People think Syria is at peace. People suffer. They don't go back. Why? Because at the moment they go back, they get into major trouble. Uh, it's it, problematic because there's still the risk of a massacre in Idlib. Uh, there is still the issue what happens, is the, you know, what should be done in terms of, of some diplomatic arrangement between the northeastern part of Syria and the regime in, in Damascus. Now, these are questions that do not go away. And they will come back with a vengeance. So one last question. I want to come back. Uh, you mentioned arms control and the need to sort out a modus vivendi with Russia within Europe, really. Yeah. How do you see the European role in that? For so long, arms control has been a U.S.-Russia dynamic. Do you see Europe uh, taking on more, inde more independent stance or several independent stances on the question of control of both conventional and non-conventional weapons and new technologies. Well, I think at least Europe should dare to take the initiatives on this. I remember very well we could do this uh, uh, very well with, with Germany, to a certain extent with France. Of course, you know, the issue of Brexit and how the United Kingdom will continue to work in Europe on these issues which we, will be vital, but it's also the changing of the US position. When we had the big uh, crisis of cruise missiles, which we are mm -hmm. now talking about the INF in the, in the 80s, uh, there was a big controversy between the U.S. and Europe also at that time. In a and Europe world. played a tremendous role in making that treaty happen. Absolutely. And also because the Americans were also, uh, they had the ideas what they wanted, but at least knew that in NATO they, they would want to get the support. And we see this at the moment not occurring. That means that we shouldn't see this as a subsid subsidiary topic, but as a, as, a, as a vital one, which is completely different. As I said, it has to become more multilateral. But I see some states uh, within NATO should be willing to do that. And I feel that not many are trying to do that because of the, the relationships in NATO and defense expenditures and so on. And here, Europe has to be also a bit more clear about what it wants. I think it's good we work on European defense initiatives, at least when it's part of a, you know, a peace-building exercise in, 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 in the world. Uh, let's do that. I have no problem investing in it either, even financially. But it means also, you know, when you share the burden, you share control. I think that's a really fantastic note to end on. We've been talking about a Europe surrounded by and importing instability. And this is one way in which Europe can start rebuilding and exporting stability. Bert Kunders, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.
Thanks for tuning in to War and Peace. Uh, if you want to read either of the crisis group reports that were mentioned, uh, the one on Mali is called Talking with the Bad Guys, and the one on Ukraine is called Rebels Without a Cause. You can find them on the Crisis Group website at www.crisisgroup.org. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.